I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I got a partner and that was good enough. And I just jumped. People are trying to make everything perfect before they jump, but there is no perfection. I'm not perfect, but what I'm good at is jumping, doing and course correcting along the way. So I encourage people that we got this one life, man. At some point you got to jump. Welcome everyone to the Roadless Travel Show. This is a show about people that were successful in a previous career and left that career to go down a different path. I'm your co-host, Richard Coyne. And I'm your co-host, Bill Zayler. On today's show, we're so pleased to have Maurice Philogene with us. Maurice, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yes, thanks again, Maurice, for being on the uh, Roadless Travel Show. Uh, to start with, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your, your background, how long you were in one of your initial, initial work uh, roles? <laughs> <laughs> Sure. And uh, I think my, my my maybe my story is a little bit um, maybe more attainable from for some because I did everything parallel. So uh, I was I was uh, an executive at Accenture, which is a global IT management consulting firm right out of college, right out of University of Virginia. They hired me in the D.C. area. They were my foundation for my entire professional life. And even though I am very much an entrepreneur and solopreneur, I talk about that career with all fondness because of everything that it gave me. Um, I was also in the U.S. military. I needed a way to pay for school. So uh, ROTC was my path. I uh, ended up in the Air Force on the reserve side, but I did 10 years of active duty because I volunteered so much and ended up as a retired lieutenant colonel. And then I served as a federal agent. So think the TV show NCIS, but the Air Force's version, which is called OSI. So I ran field offices all over the world, um, Mideast, Africa, U.S., et cetera. And then in 2008, as a means to give back to local community, post one of my deployments, I came back, was sitting in my corporate office, and I'm like, no, nah, this is not working for me. I was helping people all over the world. I still want to help. So I ended up being a local street cop in uh, Montgomery County, Maryland for 15 years. And then I retired from everything in 2021 around that time frame. And then kept on with real estate, which I've been doing since goodness, since I was in my early twenties. That is that is quite a background. <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> yeah. all at once. But when you say in, a, in transition real estate, I guess what um, you have been doing for quite a while. What did you initially start real estate, and then what have you transitioned into now? Yeah, so in my early twenties, I found the concept of passive income just by reading financial books. I started buying condos in the D.C. area, um, got lucky. In a lot of cases, I got lucky just because it was in, during the 2000 boom cycle. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but I got myself up to 35 single family homes, sold a bunch of them, uh, took the equity from those, added my paycheck. And I just slowly started paying off these condos over the years and got myself to 18 paid off condos. When you, when your basic needs are covered, I mean, my, my entire goal was not money. My entire goal was to give myself a means to control my time. Because at the time in my twenties, I had started traveling actually in my teens, I started traveling, started realizing the world was a lot bigger than Boston, Massachusetts, where I grew up. And I was like, man, if I can find a way after finding passive income, if I can find a way to control my time, then I can go back to traveling because I felt like I was plugging into planet and life as intended. Um, so I, I found the real estate stuff, did that. I was just systematically using my paychecks. And then there, a transition point came, that was 2002. So a transition point came in 2015. When you have enough money to cover your basic needs, you quickly realize life is not about money. I wasn't growing. I was pressing repeat on the same real estate formula for the past 15 years. And I was like, I'm, I'm bored. This doesn't feel good. I found a multifamily seminar did a couple of multifamily deals myself. The first two were mobile home communities. And then I started a company with four other partners four years ago called Quattro Capital. And we've syndicated 28 apartment complexes since. So it's just been this growth, but the growth was not a money chase. The growth was a growth chase. I just needed to do something different. And it's all culminated now in me Meshing real estate and life, I'm now uh, developing land on the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean, and I'm on my third project there now. Mm -hmm. So it's just been this unique involvement of who who I am, and my identity has shifted over time. Um, but real estate played a big role. Oh, yeah, that's quite a, quite an impressive story. From like the condos, like paying off basically half of those, yeah, and yeah. Uh, having the income from those, and and then going into the multi-family, twenty-eight deals, and that that's impressive as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Is there a certain area your group looks to um, invest in? Is it re any regional or just opportunity based? Or uh, so, Quattro Capital, we we are very southeast southwest focused. Uh, <laughs> we I don't want to deal with snow. I, <laughs> I I don't we we don't have to deal with snow. And we are also very sensitive about insurance these days because insurance in certain jurisdictions, especially Florida and Texas, although we do own property in Texas, it has more than doubled. Yep. And going from a $200,000 bill to a $400,000 bill impacts the bottom line in a massive way. Um, but we are in eight states, eight or nine states, Georgia, Texas, Alabama, Tennessee, Indiana, North Carolina, and I feel like I'm missing something, but in general, southeast, south, southwest. Mm -hmm. But and when I say southwest, I'm just talking about Texas. We're we're not like Arizona or anything, but just oh, Texas. Yeah, yeah. some I great think. areas. Yeah, 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 yeah. some great areas. Wow. So that um, and and now you're doing development in Cyprus. That's pretty cool. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, it's like I tell people, real estate and business in general, like I. I opened clubs and coffee shops in my day too. I was just this entrepreneurially minded guy, but they're all goal specific. It's not, hey man, I'm going to go to the Mediterranean and develop real estate so I can make tons of money. That's not what I did. I'm on my third real estate life. The first real estate life was the financial freedom journey, the condos. The second real estate life was I got to learn something. So I started doing apartment complexes, mobile home communities. And now the third real estate life is lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I'm an East Coast dude. I'm an East Coast brother, right? I was born in New York, raised in Boston, and now I'm based out of D.C. That's 40 plus years of, DC, or of East Coast. I get it. I know how to operate here. Nobody's really going to teach me in here. I was a street cop here. You can't really scare me about anything. But now I'm in a different community overseas where I'm in, in a beginner's mindset. I have to relearn mm -hmm. things. I have to learn from scratch. I have to learn a new language. Nothing is digital over there. So I got to be on a plane a lot. And I like the the I like the feeling of beginner's mindset and constant learning. So re real estate is not, or business is not as people think, which is oh, you're just making money. No, it's it's specific to what you want to do for your life, and it's a tool for that. Yeah. What uh, what are you developing uh, in in Cyprus? Is it is it multifamily? Is it live work? Kind yeah. Of what's, what's the plan? So it's different, and once again. Uh, it's, it's goal specific. I, I have a mentor who's my business partner. His family's been doing this for years, but the first project is a neighborhood of 16 villas. I quickly learned that we have requirements for natural resources. So we could only build 12 and then I'm keeping one for my own family. So that is a pretty cool one because it's, it's a neighborhood of 12 villas. that's on the side of a mountain that the front view is an infinity pool view to the Mediterranean, which is like oh, nice. insanely beautiful. And then the second project, once again, I'm learning. I thought we were going to be able to squeeze in 90 apartments that we could sell one by one. So effectively condos, if you will. Um, but we could only build 66 because of requirements. Um, and then we just broke ground. So, and then we'll, we'll sell those one, one by one. Um, and these are all things that people will own. Although, the idea on the apartment complex is we will uh, write into our contracts that we will take care of the maintenance inside and outside of the units, right? So we'll have a way to have business post selling the properties because a lot of them will be second homes for people. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got mm -hmm. it. So um, Cyprus, the language is between Greek and Turkish. Is that right? There you go. Yep. Those are the okay. two predominant on the island. Gotcha. Gotcha. Wow. So what are the contracts done? In, are they done in Greek? They're, they're done. It depends on where you are in the island. But yeah, they can yeah. be in Greek. They can be in Turkish, but they can also be in English because the island up until 1960 was run by the British. OK, so gotcha. I transact in British pounds. Mm -hmm. I do some transactions in the euro. And then from time to time, I'm hiring Turkish labor. So I pay in lira. Mm hmm. Okay, <laughs> let me go figure figure this nonsense out. Yeah, so it's, keep, it's, it's, it's dynamic. Keep your foreign currency uh, calculator handy. So, uh, <laughs> man, wow, that's it. So, uh, it, Maurice, it's funny you say. Actually, I started my career with Anderson Consulting now. In oh, sense. right on, so, brother. Yeah, actually, I actually had at the DC office. So, okay, yeah. when did when when were you there? Oh goodness, uh, eighty nine to ninety. 
93, 92. I think I left it at the end of 92. 92. Okay. Yeah. I got there. Yeah. We were still Anderson. I got there in 97. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Missed each other by a couple of years. I think, yeah. uh, and I know they at some point shifted out to Tyson's Corner versus, um, uh, not Tyson's Corner, um, uh, uh, Reston. 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 Yeah. yeah. Reston. And then now, uh, then they went back to Arlington again. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Good deal. Hey, so uh, with your with your background, I'm sure you got a funny story you can share. Anything you can uh, mention? Which background? <laughs> hey, you, you choose. You choose something funny that happened to you along the way. Um, something funny that happened to me along the way. I don't know. It's just that's tough to say. I think what people here's something. I think this will be of interest to people because I get it on social media. Like, hey, Mo. How did you manage to have two full-time careers and do entrepreneurial stuff at the same time? Because I was doing the Anderson slash Accenture stuff Mm full-time. Then I would run home, do stuff with my kids, sleep for an hour, get up, put on my uniform, and go patrol. Um, Then I would patrol all night. And usually around 1 a.m., assuming we didn't have calls, but we had calls a lot because we were the busiest midnight shift when I was there. I would be doing real estate on my computer in the car or in between calls or what have you. And then around 6 a.m., I would start to shut down. I would head home, sleep for maybe three hours, two hours, get up, get dressed, run to court, check in, because my cases were usually solid, so they didn't need me the whole day. Then I would walk out of the courthouse, walk to the train station, which was two minutes away, get on the metro, go back to Accenture, and restart my day. And the funny thing is people are like, no, it's impossible. You don't have all that time. No, you do. And here's the way it worked for me. It just became a rhythm. Mm -hmm. And when I got tired, I would use my PTO, my vacation strategically to catch up on sleep. But I wanted it that that much. So let's say even at Accenture, sometimes I would literally slide out at lunch when people are going to eat lunch. I would slam slam down a sandwich and go sleep in my car for an hour, hour, hour and a half. It's just that I it, it seems crazy, but I wanted to. I didn't want the 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 titles and like I turned down the partner track like four times. I wasn't interested in that. What I was interested in was much more like, how am I going to fill my life book doing stuff mm-hmm. uh, as much as possible before I punch from this W2 world? And that's kind of how I did it. I would find ways in the cracks to make everything happen. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah, that's definitely ambitious to... Uh figure out how to do all that stuff at, uh, at once. And, uh, yeah. you know, while, while not <laughs> becoming the zombie from lack of sleep. So very nice. Yeah. 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 That would happen sometimes too. Trust me. It wasn't all like roses and rainbows and stuff, but it, it was an interesting yeah. run. But when I think about it now, it, it exhausts me. <laughs> like, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know how I did all that, but I'm, I'm grateful for the journey for sure. Mm-hmm. Three hour, three hours a night. You're almost retired at that point. I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Oh, great, Reese. Well, um, well, you kind of talked about it already, but uh, maybe we'll dig a little bit deeper into sure. uh, like a deciding factor that uh, had you leave your your W two jobs. It sounded it wasn't money driven. It seemed like it was fulfillment uh, and learning. You seem like it's kind of a lifetime time learner, along with your entrepreneurial bent. Yeah, it was. It was for all three of them. Uh, even though the military was technically reserved, it was technically full time because I was a federal agent. It was kind of weird, but for all three of them, it was just time. It was time. I could feel it. So in the military, I actually retired military October 19 after 22 years. And that's just because as a lieutenant colonel, which is technically a senior officer, there is an expectation that you're going to pull back to headquarters and start writing policy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And man, that is just not my personality. Like I just wanted to be out in the field with men and women and doing a good job and running field offices and being in Africa and Turkey and Germany and I ran field offices in Vegas and D.C. It was just time. But true to form, because I had done real estate all those years, the money wasn't a concern. When uh, when I left Accenture in uh, October 31st, 2021, I felt it. I, I had turned down the partner track four times because I didn't want the extra 30 hours a week for 40 grand. Like it just it didn't make sense for me. Um and I got the sense that the the let's say the horses were starting to circle me a little bit in that, look, they could probably pay someone half what they were paying me at this point, who was 10 years younger, to do the exact same job. I could just feel it. You could feel it. Mm-hmm. It didn't mean that I was 
not doing my job or whatever. It was just 25 years, man. It was just it was just time. And then for the police, it that was a different thing. The the George Floyd incident had happened about a year and a half earlier. We won't get into the politics of that, but on the on the policing side of it, the men and women who were doing the right things by the community, everything changed for us. Mm -hmm. Because it used to be that I was proactive. I was the police officer who was in the back neighborhoods at 3 a.m. looking for someone who was trying to break into a house. You know, you just see a random patrol car just kind of creeping through with his lights off. That was me. I loved it. I loved being part of my community and impacting people in a different way. And after George Floyd, the community really didn't want you out there. And you also didn't want to put yourself in a situation where at 6 a.m. you were being misconstrued on the news and all that. I'll never forget my my beat partner, who was a female and she had four kids. And she said to me one night, she's like, please don't go be proactive tonight. I was like, why? She's like, Maurice, you know what? I got four kids. Um, I just want to go home and I don't want to turn the news on where people are saying I'm a bad person anymore. Yeah. So uh, and, and I wasn't doing that for the money for sure. And um, one day I went up to my sergeant in, I think, September of 2021. He looked at me and he's like, oh, man, you're done, aren't you? And I was like, yeah, man, because we're all we're doing is we're coming to work and we're 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 reacting to calls and not going to the non-essential ones. And I didn't think that that was policing. So it's just time. I think you have to figure out what is your time frame in your journey to make a shift. And I, I just in all three cases, I could feel it. It was time to go. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah wow yeah definitely i i, I get you you know you, you certainly can get that feeling that it you know I've, I've had a good run but it's time it's time to yeah. do something different so yeah well good mm -hmm. well 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 done for you to recognize that so and actually three times so there you go yeah and, it, and i'll just say it wasn't easy uh yeah. for both police and military i cried like a baby because i didn't want to go mm -hmm. i i, I you, you realize you were leaving a family. You realize that you were leaving something unique that had been part of your identity for so long. I didn't want to leave my brothers and sisters. I didn't want to leave my community. I still have shop owners who call me. It's just, it's two years and people yeah. will still call me and I got to like, hey, let me get you in touch with somebody at the station, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was hard, but that's the journey. And then you do figure out, especially if you're in service, public service. When you're the old head, there comes a point where you have to make space for people who are coming up. You right. give them the knowledge you have, you make space, and then you be a good citizen and witness. And that's hard for someone who's been an A personality and been out in the field and wants to help. But I'm I'm good now. It's just like when I tried out for the NFL. I played football, too. When I tried out for the NFL, at my last tryout, I was like, yeah, I'm done now. I can... I can I can kind of let this go and be a good fan now. It's the same mm -hmm. thing for working in the in the public space. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things that I think is uh, you talk about the headspace and creating room for the for the next generation. One of the things that I've always done in my leadership roles is always look for who is that next leader who's yeah. gonna who's gonna step in and and how can I mentor and how can I help that person That's you right. know you know be ready and 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 rise to the occasion when needed. You know, I've always taken the position that. You know, in, in in leadership roles, that I'm a servant leader. You know, I mm -hmm. I'm here to serve. I'm here to to do it as long as I'm needed. You know, mm -hmm. if somebody else is ready to step up, I'm happy to pass the torch. Mm -hmm. And and again, but again, in order to do that, you have to have that next level, next tier of person that's ready to step up at that time. So yeah, yeah. for sure, yeah. you got to recognize that person. Yeah, exactly. So so Maurice, go way back. Um, again, yeah, maybe maybe it was when you um really first starting in real estate you you kind of mm. said already that you you kind of just got dumb lucky and that's great but uh mm -hmm. were there some obstacles you had to kind of overcome as you were maybe maybe that's a point makes sense to talk about that or, or if you want to talk about oh, perhaps uh, moving into the mobile home parks that's fine you know but what, what obstacles could you have to overcome brother the the the, the biggest obstacle in in my early days was the 08 cycle was mm -hmm. the 08 financial crisis because mm -hmm. I, when I when I mean I was lucky, it's just that my my timing was meeting my preparation, right? I, like I was always in aisle six of the Fairfax County Library reading a book. and But then here you had this market where you could buy a condo that wasn't even built yet. Let's say the contract price was 200 grand. And by the time the thing was built, it was worth 320. Like I was just printing money and I didn't mm -hmm. know anything about cycles. So when 2006 hit, 2007 hit, 
uh, half my tenants stopped paying. Mm. Now, I was doing the right thing in that I had six figures of reserve in the bank. So if half your if tenants stop paying, you still have a responsibility to meet those mortgage obligations. I was still meeting them, but a hundred grand is not going to last very long for thirty plus condos, right? Right. The way that I dealt with it was like I had I had friends who were filing bankruptcy and just like giving up, and I'm like, no, nah, I work eight years for this. I I I. I can't let this go. How am I going to solve it? The way that I solved it was I just kept calling the banks. I remember a period of like seven months where I was constantly on the phone trying to do a workout, loan modification, a short sale. I had maybe one or two foreclosures, very few relative to what was going on at the time. I had maybe four short sales. I had one deed in lieu. But the crazy thing was, and this is what I had to figure out, and I figured it out by talking to loan officers and talking to people who were going through the downturn. I had to stop paying the mortgages because I've said this somewhere else on some other podcast or whatever, but because the lenders would not listen to me. Mm -hmm. I was telling them, listen, I am going to run out of money. I am doing the right thing. I am paying, but it is coming. I'm going to fall off this cliff. I need your help. And they wouldn't listen to you unless you were three or four months delinquent. Wow. So I had to purposefully stop paying, which is not in my nature, just to get them to listen, just so I could start doing workout programs with them if they were available. So I started playing this kind of cat and mouse game the stress level on me as a late 20s, early 30s doing this by myself, and that's the other thing I'll tell you just after, but the stress level was insane. And I added being a police officer in 08. So you could even imagine I was sleep deprived, plus dealing with all these issues related to the downturn. And the other thing that I had really truly did not see at the time, which I finally got right in 2015, 16, was just I was doing too much by myself, Mm -hmm. way too much. I did not surround myself with like-minded people. I thought I was different. It wasn't that I was different. It's just that I couldn't find people who were thinking about life like me, that I wanted time freedom and financial freedom and to be geographically free to travel to 100 countries and stuff like that. So I internalized everything and just went on this entrepreneurial journey. And I call that state entrepreneurial depression. I had it like nobody's Mm -hmm. business. Um, I just didn't realize it until 2015, 2016, after I came back from a military deployment and was spending time with mental health professionals. It was required coming back from deployment. But those two things were the biggest challenges for me. One, I kind of got in over my head when 2006, seven showed up. I was chasing my ego a little bit, maybe bought too many things and people stopped paying. And then two, I had to solve this issue about Dude, you're doing way too much on your own. You've, you've got to surround yourself with like-minded people. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You get uh, more done by by traveling together with others others you than do. by yourself. You do. Yeah. And, and hence, um, $5 million in real estate on my own through 2016-ish. And then $200 million in the last four years. Because wow. I'm with people. It's different. It's just different. I'm not saying that one journey is better than the other because it's not about the money. It's just about the impact and what you're able to move together. How many people you tend to, if you are helping a lot of people, you tend to make money as a consequence of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what has happened. Um, But you, you know, you learn that as you get older, Um, but it's still been a good journey. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. Maurice, well, thinking back to maybe and maybe starting from your your syndication uh, yeah. company day, days, uh, what was like one of the first victories that you, you had that you realized that you're on the right path and this is this is achievable? So when I switched to multifamily, I did one, two, three, four, five, five multifamily deals by myself, one or two partners, but general generally on my own. The biggest victory was when um, my friend Erin, who's now my business partner, I met her in Boston at a real estate conference because I donated to her charity. She calls me a year later. She says, um, hey, Mo, can you sponsor this $3 million deal? Because I had the net worth to do it. It was a 36-unit complex in Tennessee for $3 million. And she's like, I got these three other people. 
I was like, eh, I'm not used to doing deals with a lot of people. <laughs> I really didn't want to because I like to be in control of my space, if you will. But I did that deal, thankfully, because what ended up happening. Um, so we closed that deal January of 2020. It was such a seamless effort because everybody had strengths and weaknesses and we kind of took care of that. And there we were in January 2020 owning a 36 unit complex, no investors, just us. And Aaron mm -hmm. said, why don't we all stick together? I was like, what do you mean? She's like, why don't we start a company? I don't know about that. I, I really had to get over this notion that I had to do things on my own or whatever. I did. And that's how Quattro Capital started. And that's how we've, we've, we've done 28 deals ever since. And we've, I think we've raised 80 million, 80 or $90 million at this point and sold the last six deal, six or seven deals we've sold. We've um, returned 25% or more to investors and we've done a good job of it. Although today's times are more challenging with interest rates higher. Yeah. It just, I, I, I learned something. So that was a very good thing that happened, which was for me to let down my old notions of what, success was and just like trust the process and i'm, I'm glad that i did good good yeah. maurice uh, more recently is there a, a funny story that you can share uh maybe it's the uh the maybe it's the turkish laborers trying to get paid in euros and you're like wait a minute no 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 you're supposed to be paying <laughs> liras you know <laughs> uh how about on the real estate side but just trying to think of what a funny a funny thing that's going on um well, even not so much funny, but I'm starting to understand what it's going to take to be out there from an international business perspective. Some of the land that I bought or that me and my partner bought, I should say, it we bought it for 300,000, 330,000 equivalent 330,000 US. And um world dynamics have created a lot of people coming into Cyprus. Uh, so that land has become increasingly more valuable and, um, that we got a seven figure offer for it in less than two years, which is crazy. Wow. Not, not, not little, like one, six, 1. 1.6. I mean, that's wow. Wow. insane. So, so five X, five, five plus, X. five yeah, plus yeah, X. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I flew back to kind of help out with that, but. The funny part is I don't, I don't speak Turkish. Like it's not just, it's not going to, it was a Turkish buyer coming out of Turkey. So I, I couldn't affect the sale. I couldn't do anything. I'm kind of sitting there just like hearing the translation through my partner and all that type of stuff. Um, but it's just kind of one of those funny things. I see 2008, 2000s repeating itself. There's a boom going on. This one is related to population influx. I can see it. It's almost like history is repeating itself. So I'm like, dude, it's time to sell because, <laughs> because we have an opportunity. We can take that money. We can take some off the table for our families, impact our lives. We can go do some philanthropy work with it. We can even put a little piece of piece of that land aside for the local jurisdiction to make sure locals have something to hold on to forever. Not necessarily a funny thing, but I just kind of like seeing life repeat itself. Yeah. Um, and I want a more simple life nowadays. So I tend to opt for look if we're going to make a good return and it simplifies my life i i tend to do it now because i don't want to be in complexity forever yeah good great makes sense yeah well Marie, uh, where are you today in your journey uh it's not like you're still doing the multifamily syndication you're doing uh, land development uh overseas in cyprus mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are you focused on any particular one or just all opportunities that come come uh, available to you my life is a bit more dynamic than real estate. Real, real Again, real estate for me is just a tool. Um, I'm, I'm certainly proud of Quattro Capital. Um, so we're still syndicating. Our last deal was a $38 million, 240 unit complex in Houston, December of 2022. Interest rates are up. So right now we're focused on debt management, and taking care of the portfolio more so than buying at the moment. Uh, in fact, I'm flying to Houston tomorrow to, to go tour the properties, make sure everything's okay. But that's real estate. I'm, I'm grateful for it. If I can help someone on their financial freedom journey move move faster than I did, that's the purpose of that for me, along with giving people good affordable housing. Um, from a different perspective, I am coaching people in from lifestyle in lifestyle design. So I have my own company called Try Life On, which is at trylifeon.com. It's helping people orient their lifestyle uh, to be one that they do not need a vacation from. 
I don't take vacations anymore. I just kind of float around the world. I work from my laptop, my cell phone. I don't want employees. I don't want my name on the side of a building. I don't want to be the biggest, baddest, anything. What I want is flexibility. And I'm trying to teach people that you can let a job as a purpose or it's purposeful. Street cop, military, that was my purpose. That was my God-given gift to be here. Accenture, purposeful. I took those two paychecks. I invested in real estate systematically over two decades, and I put myself in a good position. People can do that for their lives. They can orient their decisions re related to work, related to lifestyle, related to what they invest in, such that they have more mobility if they want, or they can be home with their kids if they want. So I spent a lot of time on lifestyle design, uh, started a podcast related to it, Try, uh, Try Life On, and I have some media projects coming out in the form of a book and maybe some TV stuff related to it as well. Nice. This all goes back to what I told you in the beginning, and I hope that people pick up on this. I'm grateful for real estate. I'm grateful for the W-2. I'm grateful for all of it. But we've we've got this one set of days, 28,000 on average, which is age 80. We've got this one set of days to fill your life book with experiences and stuff that you can do. And it ain't got nothing to do with money. I mean, once if you can cover your basic needs, then what you do is you give yourself life options to go do other stuff and fail and do well and impact people. And I'm always looking for new things to do. So Try Life On is the new thing that I've been working on for about uh, a year and a half, two years now. Nice. nice. That's nice. Excellent. Yeah. We'll mention that in the show notes. So very, very Thank cool. You. Appreciate yeah, that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so Maurice, uh, it, it sounds like Try Life On is, is a lot of it in, in mm -hmm. terms of helping other people, but just, uh, we, we always like to ask, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, we feel like we've been very blessed in our lives and, and we try to give back. And, and, you know, is there anything you want to mention as well that you do to give back maybe through yourself or through your company to give back to help others? I'm a, I am a novice philanthropist of learning. I have learned that I don't like to give through organizations because I don't, I can't feel it. Selfishly, I want to know when I'm helping someone. So my moniker quietly is, what can I do to change someone's decade in five minutes? You know, so I'll I'll do things like pay for someone's surgery or uh, my oldest son is high functioning autistic. So some autistic kids, you know, will pay for like two years of a one on one tutor to follow him and follow them in the school system, stuff like that. Um, there's a, there's a myriad of things that, that I, that I get involved in that, that I could tell people, but I think the biggest thing I want people to know is that you can try life on at any point. Like we are 20, 30 years of formal education tells us what to be, where to go, what to look like, what title to have. Hey, you work for Accenture. You should be a partner. It's been 25 years. Why are you not a partner yet? Yeah. Cause I don't need to be, I was busy buying real estate. So I would have choices when I get out. I, I don't want to be a partner. It's, that's not my path. Yeah. Why are you a police officer at the same time? Because I want to be. Well, it's not possible to do full to, to, full two full-time jobs. Really? You sure? Because I did it for 15 years. People have got to get away from this. This is what society is telling me to be thing. People has also got to get away from, please don't listen to what I said about real estate in terms of 18 condos paid off and 2,000 units for Quattro Capital and development overseas. No, buy three, pay off two, move somewhere where cost of living is low and live your life well. We're, we're, we're all like following the social media highlight of things, thinking that we have to achieve that. Mm -hmm. That's why I got so into the lifestyle design aspect of reverse engineer what you need. How much money do you need on a monthly basis? Where does your heart and soul tell you you want to live? Who do you want to be with? All right, let's work towards that, not what everybody else is saying. So I tell people, you can try life on your way whenever you want. You don't have to follow the societal definition of things because just as a wrap up to that, most people are not doing what it is they want to do because of the opinions of peers, coworkers, neighbors, or even their family saying, this is what you're supposed to be. Nah, I'm good. If I if I did that when I was 21, I would have never had all these life experiences that I've expressed to you. And I haven't even talked about the 100 countries 300 times. And I, I want people to go try life on the way 
that they want to, not the way that society, not the way they think society wants them to. Right. Yeah. I mean, Kiyosaki talks about that from day one, that there's so much where people are expected to do this because that's the norm. Well, sorry, yes. I, I don't want to be a norm. Yes. I don't want to be normal. I want to, I want to do what I want to do. And and that is more entrepreneurial than, you know, and others. And, you know, but, and, and again, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of, um, not a, a lot of negativity from people who say, wait a second, you're not doing the normal. What What's going on here? That's not, that's not okay. Why, 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 why? It, yeah. You know, so. And I heard a great, I don't know where I heard the quote or if I made it up. I don't know. Anything I make up is because I read other things and then piece it all together. But the thing that comes to my mind is, Societal rules were created by by someone no smarter than you, than you or I. Mm -hmm. Why am I bound to them? I think the problem is we are given a set of rules when we walk out of high school, we walk out of college, and we assume those to be the thing. Like it 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 takes into us as the gospel. Hey, the professor said I should go get a job at Google because Google is the best company. Mm. Okay, you could also go to a ten thousand dollar tech school and make one hundred and forty thousand as an HVAC technician, buy one piece of property a year for six years, and be good for your whole life. Like it's 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 it, where where we are just adopting this normal path, and I just refuse to do it. And I I think that more people should put blinders on and think that way for themselves as well. Well said. Yeah. Well, Maurice, is there is there something you've um, recently implemented in any of your businesses kind of uh, helped you scale and grow? Yeah, the opposite of that. I'm being facetious, but I I am being very careful to not allow over complexity into my life. Mm -hmm. And in areas where I am a bit complex, I am simplifying big time. Nice. I don't like the I don't for my own life, I don't like the idea of scale. I like the idea of automation and simplification and not over automation, just enough to do what it is you got to do to create and protect time so you can live the way you want. So, for example, my coaching business, the trylifeon.com stuff I was telling you about. So I coach people one on one. It's high end coaching. I just do 10 people. I could create an online course for more revenue. I could do group coaching if I want. I don't want to do any of that. I just want to coach 10 people because I can dramatically impact their lives. I will create a friend for life because we will know each other intimately well. And all I need for that is one website, the ability to store videos, the ability to schedule. Uh, and I have a chat group for anyone who's been through coaching on Slack. That's it. Now I could go create a massive company. I could be go after the Tony Robbins of it all. And I'm not saying it's wrong for anyone, but I'm saying it's wrong for me. I don't mm -hmm. want that. I want to be able to, tomorrow morning, I'm, I'll travel hack my way to Houston. Next week, I'll travel hack my way back to the Mediterranean. I want that. So I want to keep my life as simple as possible. So when I look at my real estate portfolio or even the things that I may or may not acquire in the future, the first thing I ask myself is, can I afford it? Not from a money perspective, but from a time perspective. Is this going to be something that I can buy and plug in that will be minimal time? Or is this going to be something that's going to take up a lot of my time? And if it's the latter, I don't do it. I just don't. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be, I'm 48 years old now. I have relative time freedom. My kid is 10. I'm available. We throw the football every day. Uh, I'm not interested in going back to a world of complexity where I just don't have time to do the things that make me happy. So it's the opposite right now for me. I'm not scaling as much as I am being very conscious about doing things that are not complex or, or add complexity to my life. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Yeah. So, uh, again, there's a Cal Newton, I think it's Cal Newton, uh, had a book on digital minimalism. And mm -hmm. it, it, in a way, you're applying that to really more, to, more than just your digital life in, into your whole life. So I, I, like, I like the idea right. and the simplifying concept. Uh, that's great. There, um, there, there's a, just one more thing. There's a book called Die With Zero by Bill Perkins. He's mm -hmm. a former hedge fund manager. He talks about that. He talks about digital and personal minimalism, where the more stuff we get rid of, the more we seem to feel more free. I just mm -hmm. cleared out my office because I'm moving to a new house. And I was like, man, why do I still have letters from girls from back in high school? Right. Why, why am I carrying this stuff around from place to place to place? And we we got rid of all the junk that we don't think that we need. 
I'm telling you, it's just a freer feeling, less stuff to take care of is a more beneficial life from my perspective. Nice. Nice. Maurice, is there, um, what advice would you give somebody who's considering making a path change? At some point you got to jump, man, I'm, I'm not the best entrepreneur. I am certainly not the best business person. I failed coffee shops. I failed clubs. I did pretty good in real estate. Um, I'm doing okay in solopreneurship via coaching. I'm an okay podcast host. At some point, you got to jump. I didn't know what the hell I was doing relative to the development stuff overseas, but I got a partner and that was good enough and I just jumped. Okay, I threw some money at some land and oh my God, it's 5X in less than two years. People are trying to make everything perfect before they jump, but there is no perfection. Yeah. People who are successful, all they're doing is they're just getting just enough information to make a decision they're jumping and then they're just course correcting along the way. Mm -hmm. Had I not done the condos back in the 2000s and then course corrected relative to the 2008 downturn, I wouldn't have been I wouldn't have done all this other stuff. I'm just a Haitian immigrant kid from Boston who picked up books. I'm not perfect, but what I'm good at is jumping, doing and course correcting along the way. So I encourage people, we got this one life, man. At some point you got to jump. Yeah. Yeah, we, we said it all the time. Learn, you know, don't don't go into something blindly, but at the same point yeah. in time, you gotta take you gotta take action. You gotta do something with the knowledge you've built. That's it. That's it. Yeah. That would be my advice. Nice. Well, Maurice, uh, what's the uh, best way for the listeners to reach out, learn uh, more about your coaching program or the real estate side of it? Yeah. So the coaching program is trylifeon.com. I write a try life on newsletter every other week. And podcast episode gets released every other week. So it's go to trylifefund.com and you can reach me there. My uh, real estate firm is Quattro Capital, The Quattro Way, Q-U-A-T-T-R-O-W-A-Y, thequattroway.com. We buy add value apartment complexes. We raise funds. Um, so let's say like right now, we, you know, we, we, we will do things like um, just have non-specific funds and get a good return back to people. Um, so you can find me there. I'm very active on LinkedIn, Maurice Philogene on LinkedIn. I talk all this stuff. I will talk real estate. I will talk the W2 world. I'll talk how I got out of it. But I talk about it from the context of building lifestyle you don't need a vacation from so you can plug into planet and life as intended. It ain't about money. like. But those concepts I talked about on LinkedIn. And then I am very good at getting back to people because of what I told you. It took me too long to find people like me. Right. So if I can be a resource for other people, point them in a certain direction, like I can't address everything, but I can certainly point people to different places. I try to, and then I'm very proud of the podcast I'm doing, Try Life On, um, because what I talk to you guys about today is what I'm getting out there in granular concepts through through that, and hopefully people will, will absorb me that way too, so that the podcast is a good one. Very, very nice. nice. Absolutely. Well, Maurice, we want to thank you for being on the Road Less Traveled show today. Really enjoyed the conversation. Very inspiring story. And sure. we wish you continued success. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me on. I, I do appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Maurice. We we'll do appreciate you being on as well. And we also want to thank our listeners. Please continue to give us a five-star rating so we can bring you more great content like our show today with Maurice Philogene. A uh, couple of things, Park Capital Partners, Please reach out to Bill and I, parkcapitalpartnersllc.com. We're happy to have a conversation anytime. Uh, we also want to remind everybody about the Park Capital Partners Value Add Fund. It's a 506C fund open today to accredited investors. Second, we have the Park Capital Partners Foundation, 5013C nonprofit that Bill and I created as another way that we give back. Excellent. Um, so please reach out to find out more. And uh, we're, we're happy to have a conversation anytime, parkcapitalpartnersllc.com. Remember, folks, the road less traveled may be calling you. We recommend that you listen and take action. Thanks for joining.